This presentation is titled Learn, Act, and Advocate, Supporting Undocumented Students from K-12 to College. So I know that there's a variety of an audience here, and so I'm hoping to touch upon some resources that are available to, to everyone across whatever educational platform you work in. And so um, what we're going to cover is we're going to go through learning. So what are some things that you may need to know? What are barriers to education for undocumented students? The acting portion of it. So what is your role as an educator and what are some resources that you can utilize to support undocumented students? And then the advocate portion. <clears throat> so what are the next steps beyond this presentation, beyond this uh, conference, for you to be able to continue learning and continue supporting others in that learning process? Why Plyler v. Doe is important is because it faces a very particular access for schooling for undocumented students, but also a barrier. So the Supreme Court decision determining everyone has access to an equitable education, regardless of immigration status, but it's limited to K through 12. So what does this mean? It means when we look at Plyler v. Doe, we see that 2.5 million total undocumented youth in the United States, about over 120,000 become seniors every year, about 100,000 graduate from high school every year, but only five to 10% enroll in college, and of those, only one to 3% graduate from college. So while we see Plyler providing a lot of access in K through 12, we see that access dwindling as students transition out of high school, out of K through 12, and into college. Um, and so what does this mean? It means that states are an important part of determining whether undocumented students are able to access education. So where an undocumented student lives and whether the school admits them and provides them with resources impacts students' ability to obtain education and for educators to receive trainings. So what does inclusive access to higher education look like in the United States? For the states that are in dark blue, these are states that offer in-state tuition and state financial aid regardless of immigration status. Those states in light blue only offer in-state tuition. The difference between the two is that undocumented students don't have access to FAFSA or any kind of federal financial aid or federally funded programs. So it, re it really is up to the state to create a policy in which undocumented students are able to obtain access to in-state tuition and state financial aid. This uh, chart is was updated in 2018, but you'll see New York is light blue. But as of September of last year, it would be dark blue because they just started providing in-state tuition for um, in-state financial aid for undocumented students. And so we're seeing policies continue to shift, they continue to change and continue to impact students. And another thing that I think I wanna point out is the states that are gray, that doesn't mean they don't have any kind of policy, that means they either don't have any policy initiated or they have a detrimental policy. So for example, Alabama, Georgia, and Montana, all three of those states ban undocumented students from attending college. And so if an undocumented student uh, migrated to California, grew up in California, they may have access to the California Dream Act, access to in-state tuition, while an undocumented student who migrated to Montana wouldn't have access to, to receive that kind of support and would be banned from attending colleges and universities. And so that's an important part of us kind of getting to know what it is that our states provide what it is that they don't provide in order to effectively support undocumented students. And often it means continuing to learn that. And so we're talking about education and its implications for undocumented students in K through 12, the implications for higher ed, but neither of these spaces function within, um, within a bubble of itself, right? We have external implications that come in and impact undocumented students' ability to be successful in, in K through 12 and in higher education. One of those being deportation proceedings and how the school to uh, deportation pipeline ultimately impacts undocumented students. And so how exactly does deportation proceedings, ICE, the police implicate schools? So when we look at the school deportation pipeline, we see that schools have a role in how students interact with the deportation pipeline. Example, if you have a police stationed in your school, that often means that students have to interact with them or are in danger of interacting with the deportation pipeline because of their presence. ICE agents will often wait for students to be going to school or leaving school or wait for their parents to be heading to their schools to pick them up and will and will go and, and deport them or pick them up and then deport them from there. There were several cases throughout the past couple of years of folks documenting instances in which their parents would come to pick them up at school and then um, ICE or Border Patrol, depending on where you live, would show up and pick up the parent. 
And although schools are considered a sensitive location, in addition to churches, in addition to uh, funerals, in addition to hospitals, there is no actual policy that prevents ICE or Border Patrol from entering these spaces to pick up folks. Um, one quick example that I like to give, um, or I think is important to give, is when I worked in Arizona for the past couple of years, we were trying to stop a deportation from um, a, a, a Border Patrol agent that came into a high school near the border to pick up a student. We showed them the, at the time, the President Obama memo stating that schools are considered a sensitive location. And the Border Patrol agent took the paper, ripped it up and said he doesn't have to listen to that because it's just a memo. It's not any kind of law or policy. So this is how we see that Border Patrol and ICE agents are still able to interact with schools in that way. And so another a way in which then, because I think the, the incorporation of police feels a little bit more murky for folks, is the way in which police then uh, present that kind of threat with regards to the school deportation pipeline is through a secure communities program, 287G, in which majority of counties, um, oh, I'm sorry, majority of counties in the US are currently enrolled in secure communities. What this does is that it allows police and ICE to share information amongst one another in order to detain folks that they suspect are undocumented. So it's never that they have hard proof, it's that they think they might be undocumented, they hold them um, in, in, they detain them for a longer period of time than is allowed, and then they allow ICE to come and pick them up. Uh, for example, 40 out of 62 counties in New York State are currently enrolled in 287G secure communities. And so that's another important question to ask ourselves as educators is how much do we know if our county is enrolled in that? Is that why students are also hesitant about interacting with police in addition to so many other things? Um, and so these are also important questions to ask with regards to barriers to education. So undocumented students and why this part is so important for us to understand is that undocumented students are often educating themselves on what's going on, educating their families, and educating educators on their rights as undocumented students. So in my previous position as the inaugural manager for the Immigrant Student Success Center at John Jay College, it was often students would share stories about them having to educate um, the admissions office to let them know that they do qualify for in-state tuition, that they do qualify for state financial aid. Because often other entities may not be familiar with these policies and are not seeking ways to be trained or know about these policies. And so uh, one way in which we can do that is by first showing a supportive space for undocumented and immigrant students. So the experience of undocumented students is that they are often scared or unsure about sharing their status because their livelihood could be impacted. So they don't know if you support them. They don't know if you would rather want them to be deported. Um, and so it's up to us to demonstrate what it is that we support and how we support it. And so this could mean for you all as educators to include information for undocumented students in the different presentations that you have. So if you're talking about college, you should include a section there to talk about how undocumented students are able to attend college depending on the state policies for, for the state. If you're doing a presentation on financial aid, you should include a whole slide that explains if you don't qualify for FAFSA, here are some alternative resources or come talk to me, I'm able to share more information. Another uh, more, uh, I think, front-facing way of doing that is to decorate your classroom with posters that show your support for undocumented students. This, um, I'm sure, could be tricky for other folks, but I think there are very creative ways to demonstrate that you want to advocate for your students and that at the very least communicates to your students that you're open and available to have these kinds of conversations. Secondly is being a liaison between K through 12 and college entities. So as I was sharing before, um, student, undocumented students often have to educate other entities and specifically colleges and K through 12 spaces on how to support them. One particular example is that undocumented students are often mislabeled as international and are then charged international fees. And so it's important then as for us as educators, whether K through 12 or in higher ed, to check in with our students to make sure that they're being charged correctly. And then to offer, if, with it, if it's within our capacity, to speak to admissions to explain why our student qualifies for in-state tuition, if the state allows. In this practice, it's also important to make sure that we're not outing our students as undocumented without their permission first. So you wanna make sure you talk to them and you say, hey, I can call admissions to ask why you're being charged an international rate. Do you mind if I say 
that you are undocumented and you qualify for in-state aid because you attended, because you meet all these eligibility requirements. And then explain to the student why it's important for you to share that because the admissions officer may not know if the student still feels uncomfortable, that's fine. And instead of sharing, okay, let me just call them and ask what is the protocol for undocumented students to qualify for in-state aid? And then I'll share that with you. So that's another way for us to be negotiating and uh, being a liaison for undocumented students rather than allowing, rather than having them do it on their own in a way that can feel dangerous or can feel exhausting. This particular example, um, I added this slide this morning, um, but it's important then for us to be informed about these things and how our students are being labeled, particularly with ICE's new announcement that international students who use, whose universities move to online only will need to transfer to another school or be deported. Um, what does this mean for undocumented students who are being labeled as internationals in their schools, even if they shouldn't be labeled as international or in states where they don't allow in-state tuition would have to be labeled as international or out of state. So how can, ours, how can us as educators prevent our students from being implicated further into the deportation complex that exists by asking these questions before students have to continually ask them themselves? And so this also leads to the third point, which is for us to remain up to date on what impacts undocumented students. So like I said, undocumented students are often learning as we're learning. So the DACA Supreme Court decision and the implications of that, what that's gonna look like with the next presidential election, asylum bans, public charge, like, um, folks being allowed to cross the border or not. So undocumented students are learning and processing this as it directly impacts them in real time. And so it's up to us to also be informed about this. So it's important for us to ask ourselves, how much do we know about legislation that can impact un our undocumented students? Do we need to reach out to a lawyer and or a community organization to get more information? Or should we just look it up on Google? Um, often I find myself Googling several things to figure out what's going on. And then if I need further clarification, I'll reach out to spaces that I know are well informed about this to also, let in, to also lessen the burden that they're currently facing and trying to support everyone. And then what does it mean for us to share this with our colleagues? Um, I think as I'm sharing these things, Often what I'll hear from other folks when I give these presentations is that educators are feeling overwhelmed or under-resourced, and this feels like an additional task. But as Plyler v. Doe states, part of our role as educators is to abide by Plyler v. Doe and provide an equitable education to everyone regardless of immigration status. So just as we're informed about how students who are citizens, students who are legal permanent residents, are able to apply for FAFSA, are able to attend college, should be receiving in-state tuition. It's also our responsibility to understand how undocumented students can navigate these things in the same measure. And so sharing with colleagues is another important way for us to continue advocating for our students and, not, and still feel supported. And so this means educating your colleagues. So undocumented students rely on educators to know and to help them navigate school and college. Educators are also overwhelmed and under-resourced. And especially with everything going on with COVID-19, there's an additional strain on educators transitioning into online learning that folks aren't necessarily being provided resources for. So what does it mean for us to reach out and create a network of educators who want to learn more too, who want to educate others so that you're not doing this work on your own? Um, what does it mean to speak to our administration and ask for them to provide a professional development workshop related to undocumented students, specifically for, for the teachers, for counselors, for folks who, who are interested in learning more. Um, and then what does it mean to continue sharing with more educators so that you're not the only one doing this work? My dissertation was on the networks of educators that are developed in Arizona and in New York by educators who are interested in supporting undocumented mm -hmm. students. And often it did require them to do the work on their own, but once they developed a network of um, different entities in the school, so whether it's a college counselor, a teacher, an administrator, they were able to co create a more cohesive space and that changed the climate of the school drastically. And so next steps is a lot of what I explained uh, prior to this slide is you're not alone in this learning and acting and advocating with your students you should feel comfortable reaching out to community organizations to come and give presentations, to share more information. You wanna form networks in your school so you're not doing this work on your own. 
um, in a longer presentation or in a longer training that I can provide, it's specifically like worksheets to work out who are these people, what are the next steps, what are your school needs, asking students what they need, knowing that, no, making sure that you're also addressing what they need, not what we think they need. Um, but uh, I think what I'll go into now, because I want to be mindful of the time, is the resources that you can follow and that you can be connected with. So social media, I think, is a really important way to be connected um, in real time. So these are some social media spaces that I really, that I highlight, Undocu Black uh, being one of them, Familia Transqueer Liberation Movement, Baji, Undocu PhDs, but also look for organizations in your state and in your city. Um, I was trying to like list some for some of the states that are more widely represented in this, in this conference. Um, so I just Googled like, Florida, undocumented immigrants, and us, like an Instagram popped up. Those I think are really important because they often create materials in real time and are able to share them almost immediately. The last thing that I'll share related to the position that I'm currently in as the project director is our website for the CUNY Initiative on Immigration and Education. So on this website, we'll be sharing some professional development resources. So let's say your administration is like, I'm not interested in providing these kinds of trainings. I think if you find one, you can attend it, but I don't really care for it. The, we're gonna provide some professional development modules where you can take on these activities and provide them to your colleagues, provide them to your students, to other folks that are interested in your school, if your administration is not interested in doing that. If your administration is interested in doing that, you can also utilize these things. Uh, we'll share some glossaries because I know terminology can be really complicated for folks, especially when the legal aspect of it is involved. Additional resources, um, I, I will note that the resources are primarily for New York, since CUNY stands for the City University of New York, uh, but we'll also be sharing some updates that relate to undocumented students navigating these resources. Mm -hmm.